I was supposed to be going this week to um, the graduation of the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, but I got invited to Australia. And God said to me, no, Australia is more important because this is a place of my glory. I had certain things I wanted to achieve for certain. I wanted to see a kangaroo. And this morning I went and saw kangaroos with Megan. Yeah. And I wanted to see some children, and there are some children. And Steve's children are, they've become like my children. I love them so much. But one of the other big issues in coming was because my life has really been amongst all these mega, crazy, supernatural, political things of creating peace between Shia and Sunni and ISIS and terrorists and different governments. The thing which really, really spurred me on was my children in Baghdad. I had most of these children from when they were infants. ISIS turned up, knocked their churches down, knocked their houses down, put everywhere the Arabic letter N, saying, these are Nazarenes. Kill them. Everybody despised them when they were being chased from our land of Iraq. But your nation took me. It took in over 600,000 of them. And this was a mighty act of God. And I will forever be grateful to this nation. In fact, can I be honest with you? I love you even more than the Iraqis now (laughs) because you have shown real love of God in the midst of darkness. Now, before I ever speak, I always pray God's blessing in Jesus' language. None of you know it. It's a bit like tongues, so just got to ask for the gift of interpretation of Aramaic because it's Jesus' own language. So I say, Shimid Baba, Brona, Broka, Kusha, Ha Allaha, Masia, come, come, come. In the name of God, the Almighty, who is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, one God, and he is risen, risen, risen. That's what cam, cam, cam means. And so I'm so delighted to be with you today. I can't tell you how I've been so impressed by the people I've been with here. You know, I, I've met people and immediately God has said to me, that is me. And that has been what's happened in the days I've been here in Iraq. And no, I'm not in Iraq, am I? I'm the other end of the world in Australia. And um, 
you know, it's amazing how I even got connected with Stephen. I didn't know him a week ago, and now he's my best friend. So, now, I still preach in the Iraqi way. I don't expect you to get bored. And I'm happy for you to shout out at me as, as much as you like. If you think you're, I'm talking rubbish, you just say rubbish. <laughs> okay? Now, the other thing I always do is I always give out presents. I always bring chocolate for the children, and I'm so pleased there's chocolate here today for you and your brother. And you can have some as well. He needs some chocolate over there. And um, where is my gift bag? Oh, I've got my legs on it, so hard luck. <laughs> But I have loved you, all of you who I've met. I've just been so full of love that Jesus has given me for you. And then I could understand that I shouldn't be at Bethel today. Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry is really like my spiritual home nowadays and Dee's spiritual home. It's a wacky, wacky church. <laughs> it's big. We have over 6,000 members. You know, I may have had 2,000, 6,500 in Iraq, but this is even bigger. It is the most significant Bible college in the world today. And it has a big college there where they teach students supernatural ministry. And there happens to be quite a few of them here in Australia. And one of my best friends, who's called Naomi, lives here, well, in Perth, WA, and she said, I'll come up and see you. You know, I'm used to, if you go on a long journey in England, you drive for five hours. You go on a long journey here, you drive for days <laughs> and days and days, and you still don't get there. <laughs> so... It's been a kind of a supernatural experience. Anyway, I um, always ask God before I go to another country, what am I to say this time? And... Um, When I went to do a sabbatical in Bethel for four months, I said, God, what do you want me to concentrate on? And he said, the Amish. Do you know who the Amish are? They're old-fashioned looking people who don't talk to anybody else and have big woolly beards and funny old-fashioned clothes and they're just like the people that I studied in Jerusalem with because I trained with the Hasidic Jews. The Amish and the Hasids look very similar. One speaks in Yiddish, which I speak in, and the other speak in Amish, which is just like Yiddish, Germanic Dutch, and I don't understand a word of it. <laughs> so I said, Lord, the Amish are in Pennsylvania and Lancaster. They're not in Redding, California. 
the Lord said, pray for it. So I prayed for it. By the time I left there, we had 29 people in our Amish wacky group of all the really glory, glory, hallelujah. And the most significant thing was that one of the Amish men controlled the car park. So if you controlled a car park at Bethel, you know everything <laughs> because you let people in and out. Now, the other thing which I have... I have a bit of a strange life. I started off um, when I was nine. How old are you? Eight. Eight. So a year before you, my you no know, after you, the teacher asked me at school, "What do you want to do when you grow up?" So I said. Most of the children of the class wanted to be footballers or rugby players. I said, I want to be an anaesthetist and a priest. She said to me, no chance. You can only do one thing. And she said, you can't be a priest because you're Pentecostal. And they don't have priests. Which is true. But God found a way to get me to medical school, to train to be an anaesthetist. And I loved it. When I got into anaesthetics, my desire and aim then was by the age of 30, I want to run the cardiac arrest team because I was an adrenaline junkie. I loved living on adrenaline and doing wacky, crazy things quickly. And in those days, I was fit and used to just run around the place sorting people's lives out. I was good at that. And um, I was doing a locum in the hospital one summer, and it worked out because of the previous director of the crash team was caught being dodgy. He had rats and snakes in his hospital office, and it's not a very good thing to keep rats in your office. So they threw him out, and they appointed me. So I didn't get the job by the time I was 30. I got it in my late 20s. And then one day, I was thanking God so much that you have given me this incredible job. And I said, it's the most wonderful job in the world. I could do it forever. Can I stay forever, Lord? And then I said, what next? And God said to me, I want you to go into the church. And I said, what church? He said, the Anglican church. I said, Lord, they're not even all saved. And you want me to go into an unsaved church? And he said, yes. So I went into an unsaved church, and I became, I went off to Cambridge uh, to study, and I got really fed up with Christian theology it's really, really boring. You know, when I told people I was studying worship at Cambridge, and 
it was all about the order of Hippolytus. And all the worship leaders I knew had never even heard of Hippolytus. So it's how irrelevant it was. So I gave up doing Christian theology and I turned to Judaism. And I studied rabbinics and Hebrew and that was what got me into my work in the Middle East because I went first to study in Israel and I loved it and I spoke the language and God did incredible things and I worked with a really big, wacky, frightening lady. Now, all the big prophets are ladies, and they're usually larger than life. And she was called Ruth Heflin. Any of you heard of her? Yeah. Well, I was one of her product, products. And you know what she taught me? She said, always... Always give the children sweets. <laughs> Always have lots of nice things in your bag. And so I do. But I learned a lot from her. And I was introduced to her, not by one of the supernatural Christians. I was introduced to her by my rabbi, the teacher who taught me, who was called Sh Chief Rabbi Shimon Aftalis. You know, with the typical Hasidic clothes on. He said, Andrew, you've come to here to learn about the role of Israel and Christian theology. You need to know about the role of glory in Christian theology. He said, I want to send you to see somebody. He said, but it isn't a Jew. It's a Christian. And it's a woman called Ruth Heflin. I said, Rabbi, how can you send me to a woman? How can you send me to a Christian? But he did, and it was when I was there that she anointed me, and she said, your life is being called to the work of peace in the Middle East. I thought it would be in Israel, but she didn't say Israel. She said the Middle East. And so I worked for years in Israel, with Ariel Sharon and Yasser Arafat, with the good guys and the bad guys. And I used to really be one of these quite wacky Christian, Christian Zionist people, and I didn't like Yasser Arafat. When my son was about to be five, I said, Jacob, who do you want to come to your birthday party? And he said, yes, sir, Arafat. I said, it's not yes, sir, it's yes, sir. No, he said, it isn't. I see you on television with him all the time. So I said, write him a letter and I'll give it to him next week. And I gave it to him and he started to cry. He couldn't believe that a little boy prayed for him every day. And he gave him his kafia, his head skull, and wrote on it to Jacob from Yasser Arafat. And that was the beginning of a new relationship with the bad guys. You see, my role is peacemaking. And peacemaking can't between, be between nice people and nice people. Peacemaking is always between the bad guys 
and the not-so-bad guys. There were usually no good guys. In the midst of war, there were no good guys. They were all bad guys. So, so it's quite funny how things changed. I took so many preachers to see Yas Arafat. Artie Kendall used to come with me all the time. And when Yasser Arafat died, all the kind of politicians and diplomats all got ready for his funeral. And he was a Muslim. So they all thought that the grand imam of Jerusalem would do his funeral. But Yasser Arafat had said, Andrew White will do his funeral. Mm -hmm. So I did the bad guy's funeral. <laughs> and I liked him. And it's hard when you have to preach at a funeral of a really, really bad guy. You know, it doesn't matter that they've won a Nobel Peace Prize. If they're a bad guy, they're a bad guy. Mm. And I just prayed, Lord, may you have mercy on this bad guy and may you get him into the kingdom. And lots of my Christian friends said they really believe that at the last that God got him in. So, when I came to Australia, God didn't tell me to speak about the Amish. He gave me a verse from the first epistle of John. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So I really felt very clearly that God was saying to me, the most important thing I do here is to love the little children. And so the highlight of my team time here has been to love people like you and your brother. And even though Megan's not a little girl, she still gets loved like a little child. Do you mind that, Megan? Good. And it's been amazing the relationship I've developed with Steve's children. And I really love them, even though they go to the wrong school. <laughs> but we've learned to deal with that. So it's wonderful being at school with them. I went to school, and um, there was no time to fit me into a proper assembly. So they gave me a choice. They could come and see me at lunchtime. Now, usually, if I was ever given a choice of going to an extra lunchtime talk, I wouldn't have gone. But there were people who went. And it was lovely engaging with them. But I think all of us need to know that the kingdom of God is not about us oldies. It starts with the young. It starts with those young, beautiful ones who God has chosen. Look, I 
When I met Megan today, I was a bit threatened by her <laughs> because she's a brilliant mathematician. I couldn't do my basic maths exams at school. I only got into uh, medical school by cheating. <laughs> I did, I admit, I had to cheat because I wasn't good enough, but I got in. And the one thing I could do and can do is I can sort out the dose of drugs you need according to your weight. I can manage to do that all right. But it's wonderful to be with young people, little people. And reading this passage in the Greek, it does say, my little children. And there's an emphasis on them being little, very small. Not just young, my little ones. God loves his little ones so much. You know that, don't you? I know, I can see that you really, really love Jesus. People say to me, when you, were you converted? When did you get saved? I'm totally converted, but I never got converted because I always loved Jesus. And I'm sure there are others of you here who always loved Jesus. And we're reared to love Jesus. Did you, Megan? Yeah. I think so as well. I think, and certainly with Steve's children, we had quite intense conversations about these things. And um, I know that I've always loved Jesus. And I wasn't very good at being naughty. Yes, my brother, who is five times more intelligent than me, he gave up faith for a while and got into drugs and bad things. And he was a bad guy, but I didn't do any of that. <laughs> I was a bit boring. But sometimes I thank God that some of us are boring because we are boring for the sake of the kingdom. And I thank God that despite all of my academic theological study, I can remember when I went to Cambridge after doing medicine, my first essay did Marcion get it wrong? It was about Marcion, a guy who didn't believe him much. And the lecturer ripped it up and threw it on the lawn of the college. He said, you will never be able to write. This is absolutely useless. And now I've written three times more books than he has. <laughs> so... But it all goes around in a different way. And what we've all got to know is that God will use us as we are with our inadequacies and our inabilities. God can even use great mathematicians. That one I, have, I find it difficult to understand. <laughs> how he can do that, but he can, can't he? Yeah. So, I, I have as my motto in life is don't take care, take risks. And my life has been about taking risks. 
you know, it's been incredible what I have been called to do. I can remember when I was in Israel, I was so happy. And then God said to me one day, go to Iraq. And we had no um, relationship with the Iraqi government then. It had all been cut off. And I tried every Iraqi politician I knew. I knew the good guys, the bad guys. I went to them, it didn't work. And then God said to me, have you thought about praying about it? <laughs> and I hadn't prayed about it. I prayed about it. And the next day, I had a fax. You know those old things before emails? <laughs> and it was from the deputy of Saddam Hussein saying, will you come to my office next Thursday at 5 o'clock? And that was years before the Operation Desert Storm, when we took down Saddam Hussein. So I went there, and Iraq was horrendous. There was so much persecution of everybody apart from the Christians. The Christians, the biggest threat to Saddam was the Shia majority. He was Sunni. So he tried to keep all the other minority groups on his side, like the Christians and the Yazidis and the Mandeans. And I can remember going on the longest drive of my life. It wouldn't have been long for you. It only took me 32 hours. But it was quite a long way in those days. I wasn't used to have long drives then. So we arrived there, and to an Iraq falling to pieces, and the story of everybody was so terrible. And I had the secret police of Saddam Hussein looking after me all day, every day. They used to sleep on the floor outside my bedroom in the hotel. And you couldn't do anything without them knowing everything. And it was horrendous what we saw. Horrendous the amount of people we'd seen who had been killed. And Saddam had a lot of really dangerous people around him. And the worst were his sons, Uday and Kwase. One day, I'd been with Chalkaziz all day, and the Secret Service said to me that night, tomorrow you have a really, really important meeting. Well, I'd been with Tariq Aziz all day, so I said, how can it be more important? They said, it's really important. I knew it couldn't be so Saddam, so I said, is it Uday or Kwase, his sons? And he said, no, it's both of them. And I said, I'm not going. I don't want to go. He started to cry. He said, if you don't go, I get killed. All of my family get killed. So I went to the worst in the party of my life. And that was the beginning of me really being able to engage with the really, really bad guys. And God then caught me into so many things and all of the bad guys wanted me to try and stop the war. And 
I didn't have power to stop the war. And I was working with President George W. Bush, and I was his only man on the ground in the previous 203 Iraq War. And I provided all the intelligence and all the background secrets. And I confess to supporting the war. And it was the biggest mistake I've ever made. What happened was terrible. But when, when I got involved, there were Americans, British, Polish, and the Aussies, and the New Zealanders. Did you know you were part of that? And that was when I did my first Anzac Day, being chaplain, so I had to learn all about Anzac. And, but I never learned about Anzac cookies, <laughs> which are definitely the best thing about Anzac Day, until I came here. We didn't have them made by the Iraqi cooks who cooked for us. So it's very interesting being at the Anzac Day service the other day in Canberra or wherever it is, and hearing the worst prime minister speech I've ever heard. And he didn't mention God once. Doesn't believe in him. Sorry? But I just kept thinking about what Scott Morrison had done to save my people's lives. That is a mighty act of God. And that shows that God is working in you and through you. And I seriously love you. You know, my, my days of serving with the Kiwis and the Aussies will never be forgotten. It was quite funny because the ambassador at the time, the Australian ambassador, was called David Livingstone. And he was the great-great-grandson of the real missionary David Livingstone. And it's amazing how God can use all these things from our past, like me having this Bible of a gas man who was a plumber, not an anaesthetist, a plumber, but a gas man who is an anaesthetist is a bit like a plumber, lots of pipes and tubes, and the day before Smith Wigglesworth died, he said to my grandfather, he said, we may have started lives as plumbers, but our children are going to be doctors. And all of his grandchildren and all of my grandfather's children, all doctors. And it's amazing how God can turn what might seem hopeless to be an act of great victory. And I really believe that you, as a heavenly people, 
are called to be the people of great victory. And I love you so much. And I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to keep coming back. You know, it's quite sad that um, I'm no longer doing the big work in Iraq on the ground. But now my people are here. And being with all my children and seeing them all this week was just incredible. Mm. And one of my great friends, Dr. Bashar, he used to be the professor of rheumatology at um, Nineveh University. And now he's just a GP in that place, beginning with C, Canberra. And as children, we all we met with him and his children, and the children were all saying how his little boy Steve, his mother had radical secondary cancer when I was with them, and I gave him my anointing oil. And I said, I want you to anoint her every single day. And when he was with me on Sunday, he anointed all of us again, knowing that God had healed her and would heal all of us and bring us closer together. I had various dodgy things happened to me. I can remember one day I was getting very close to finding out who had kidnapped some Portuguese PSDs. PSD stands for Personal Security Detail, otherwise bodyguards. And um, I identified which of the bad guys had done it, and they captured me, and they threw me into a dungeon, and it was all completely dark, and it was only when I discovered that they hadn't taken off me my satellite phone, which had a light in it, that I thought I could at least look around where I was. And the whole of the room was filled with chopped off bits of human body. And they had thrown me there. And that was the only time in all my 30 plus years of working in war zone, the only time I was scared. And I said, Lord, I don't mind my feet, but not my hands. I need to still write. And um, that was an incredible encounter of the glory of God. But it's quite funny because all of us around the world have had to live under the whole COVID pandemic. And me being a, a cynical medic, I said, oh, it's nothing really to worry about. They're making a big fuss about nothing. Anyway, they put me in hospital, and three days later, I caught COVID. I caught full-blown COVID, almost dead, on a ventilator. And I can remember the doctors saying, in in this six weeks, I only remember two things. Six months, I remember two things. One, they asked, do you want to be resuscitated if you die? I said, no. And then at the end, when I was waking up, 
all the doctors who were treating me just happened to be people who had trained with me as a youngster. And one of the doctors, when I came around the neurologist, he came to me and said, I'm the only one of your doctors who didn't train with you. And his name was Isa Ibrahim, which is a typical Christian Iraqi name. He said, I didn't train with you, but I was in your Sunday school. When I was 10 years old, and I escaped Baghdad at the very beginning. And that, in a way, showed me that even in the midst of disaster, God is there. Now, I don't use the term wacky Christian in a negative way. I quite like being a wacky Christian. But all of us who are Holy Spirit people, we are not exempt from suffering. And we're not exempt from the agonies of this world. Some of you have experienced great agony in your life. And um, the Lord says to you today, this is a glory day. He says, I know your pain. I know your agony. But I'm holding your hand. And you are going to do greater things than you could have ever imagined. You know, I think of all the people I prayed for. I think of people who are really ill and suffering. And I get very upset by the way that some Christians treat them. Oh, you haven't been healed because you don't really believe. They say it to me all the time. You know, you've got a shoddy body because if you believed, you would be healed. I do believe. I do believe. I haven't been healed. And I know that there are so many people around, even in this room, who are suffering who are suffering from things from chronic fatigue to the muscular degeneration to depression to pain to rheumatoid disease and there is very little worse than depression i really take mental illness very seriously and a lot of people don't. And a lot of big creatures don't. Well, I might be a big creature, but I really take that seriously. And God really takes that seriously. And he just takes you by your hand. And he says, you are not alone. I am with you. And he says today, how many people in this room? He says to all of us, in your pain, he meets you now. <laughs> he doesn't say, oh, you're all right, don't worry about it, get over it. He says, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm hurting with you. I'm crying with you. That is why our Lord, our God, is so different from every other 
notion of what God and spirituality is about. He's saying, I'm here. I'm with you. I want you to know right now, this very day, that I'm holding your hand. I want you to know that my glory is upon you. You know, I, I, I've had some pretty big miracles happen in my ministry. It's quite interesting that you don't seem to get the really big miracles in Western civilization. But when I was working or when I worked in places like Iraq, I can remember one of my adopted daughters, the voice of the martyrs said to her one day, why is it, Lena, that you are here in a middle of a war zone with rockets and firearms all around you and bombs dropping all the time, and yet you are the happiest person we have ever seen. And she said, when you've lost everything, Jesus is all you've got left. And Jesus says to all of us, when you've lost everything, I am all you've got left. And I don't want to sound as if all my life I'm a really depressed, unhappy character. I'm not. I'm incredibly happy. I look at my life and ministry. I, you know, I turn to God and I say, thank you, Lord. It was quite funny. I remember worrying about not wanting my hands chopped off in the dungeon. But now I can't use my left hand at all anyway. And that was a result of COVID. But God is still with me. I, I want to show you a picture. When we took over um, Iraq, Saddam's palace became our office. We were literally sleeping all over it, under the staircases and little rooms. But the best room in the palace was his throne room, and it became the chapel. And I became chaplain. Can we say it? And, and I got a really nice chair. It, it, it used to be his throne. It was solid gold. And it was very comfortable. And it had pictures of Scud missiles behind you. And that was a typical example of how, how with God, the great may have fallen and are no more. And you who were insignificant have been might, made mighty in his power and his glory. And all that the Lord kept saying to me was that I am here and my spirit is with you. And today God says to you, I know your pain. I know your suffering. 
I know the agony that you're going through, but I am here and my spirit is with you. And I want you, he's saying, I want you to transfer the assurance of his power to others to show them his love and his might. And the Lord says to you today, there are those of you who are sick. He wants to heal you. There are those of you who are suffering in such a way that you can't tell anybody. And he says, I'm meeting you tonight. Why, I'm up, I'm over, now your turn. Say anything you want to to me. Thank you very much. Oh, we're just talking Hebrew. No, I didn't. I want to in Sydney. I'm arranging to go and visit the Chabad community. The thing is, I'm being a ultra orthodox had as hasid. I'm not into the liberal and progressive synagogues. I like the really, really ultra orthodox. Have you got many hassids here? Yeah. Yeah. Community outside of, in the Western Hemisphere, in the Southern Hemisphere. Especially, especially outside of New York, large community. Yeah, New York is, New York is bigger than Israel. I studied in Brooklyn, in Borough Park. Do you know Borough Park? Oh. Satmara and Atirakata. They're the anti, there's a whole, they're, they're groups of Hasidic Jews who don't believe in Israel. Seriously. Actually, Yeah, but that's why they're my friends, because they're bad guys. Yeah. 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 Did, did you study in Israel? Yeah. Which old pan? Uh, I was in Netanya. So, yeah. uh, it's very kind of European old pan. Oh, yeah. And Australian and... What do you do now? I um, live here in Frankston. I learned so far. We, we work in the youth here in our city. Yeah. Really? That's so good. Lovely meeting you. Thank you for having me. I really thank you for having me. Hello. So we've got any questions, um, just maybe direct them to Andrew. That'd be great. Anybody else? We might, we might close with uh, get Jaleel to play the uh, Chopin for us. Yeah. Um, well, now it's your chance. Yeah, so when you were living in Israel, um, yeah. when you were living in Israel, you were living... Um, you in the Kotel, but did you get to meet many of the Messianic Jews over there? Yeah. Yeah. Can I be honest with you? I used to be really anti the Messianic Jews. I was anti Jews for Jesus. But now I find myself as the president of the Israel Messianic Congregation. 
and the president of Christ Church, Jaffa Gate. So God changed me. Really, God changed me. And just because you're intelligent doesn't mean you know everything right. Ah. Somebody else got a question? No? Might as well come in the ground. Uh, firstly, I just want to truthfully say thank you so much for vulnerably sharing from your heart and giving us your time and all of your experience and uh, everything you have to offer. So thank you so much. Uh, I feel like I have too many questions that I could ask you, but I think... You're allowed three. Three, really? Yeah. Praise the Lamb. Number one. Number one. Uh, for all of us, uh, what would be one piece of advice you would give us in our uh, walk with Jesus and our faith in him. To pray every day that you will love Jesus more and to take risks. To pray every day that we may love Jesus more and to take risks and not care. Number two. Number two. Thanks for giving me two more questions. Uh, with all the division over the past centuries within the church, what's your uh, wisdom in bringing unity into the bride? Oh, well, I so that just happened to have a little book that I wrote. It's the smallest book I wrote. And it's called Older Brother, Younger Brother, The Christian Contribution to Jewish Suffering. And you can buy that little book today. And because I love you all, I'm saying you can pay whatever you want for it. Anything you pay goes to help out suffering, suffering people. And um, I have one thing which is quite interesting here. This is the pen that Prime Minister al-Maliki used to sign Saddam Hussein's death sentence. And it says, can an Andrew White on it? So I'll even sign it with that pen. <laughs> Thanks, man. If uh, you don't want it signed with the death pen, I've got a life pen as well. Well, I guess that'll uh, transition into my third question. <laughs> I think, oh, I could ask so many, but I think selfishly, may I please uh, maybe potentially have a look at that Smith Wigglesworth Bible you have there? Have you Usually, had I don't allow people to because, to be honest with you, this Bible is the most falling to pieces Bible I have ever seen. But um, as C.H. Spurgeon said, any Bible that's falling to pieces is being held by somebody who's not falling to pieces. You can all have a look at it. Thanks so much. Well, I pray that the glory of God Amen. will fall on all of us now. Will meet us all in our pain and our suffering. And will just give glory, glory, and glory. And I say glory, glory, hallelujah. He reigns.
he reigns. Amen. What a privilege it's been tonight to sit, sit under such an amazing, amazing group of stories and what a life this man's lived. Oh.